Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be invited to deliver this inaugural lecture to honor a very distinguished gastroenterologist in Kolkata whose insight and wonderful research has shaped medical practice far and wide. I had the pleasure of meeting the late Dr. Kamal Jalan in 1991 at his center when Dr. Bose introduced us. I'm grateful to Dr. Bose for the invitation. He is a very dear friend with whom I first had the privilege of working with in the 1980s and from whom I learned much. I have been deeply inspired by the wonderful charitable work which he continues to do. In delivering this talk, I must make clear I am simply the spokesman, for I speak on behalf of my amazing team and the patients who have the privilege to serve. My only regret is that I cannot be there with you in person because of my wife's illness. So I am grateful to my friend Dr. Matthew Kurian for helping with this presentation. Next slide. Just so you can put a face to the name, this is me in my younger days when I started in Rotherham and me recently. Next slide. So where is Rotherham situated, you might ask. So let me give you some idea. Rotherham is a town in the north of England, in the county of South Yorkshire. It has a population of around 250,000. It is in an industrial town, previously based on steel and coal. Today there is more light industry and service industries such as call centers. However, there is still a large starter steel plant. Next slide. On the left here, you can see a photo of the old hospital as it was when I started in 1973. And to the right is the new hospital which opened in 1978. Ours is a district general hospital. That is to say, it is not an academic center. Next slide. I first used forward viewing gastroscopes in my registrar days in Sheffield. You will note one had to peer through the eyepiece to see the image for video wasn't invented. In 1973, I was appointed as a consultant physician with an interest in gastroenterology in Rotherham and brought with me a small research grant of £23. We developed an open access system where general practitioners could refer their patients directly for gastroscopy without having to be seen in the outpatient clinic first. As the H2 RAs became available, more patients were referred. Together, this allowed high volume endoscopy to develop. Next slide. Please bear in mind that before the era of the H2 RA, the only medical management for peptic ulcer disease in general, and for duodenal ulcer in particular, was with prolonged bed rest in hospital. Experience showed the same could not be achieved by resting at home instead. Within this experience, there is a deeper human story. These unfortunate patients were caught up in a vicious circle of recurrent peptic ulcer causing pain, which made them unable to work. This in turn caused financial hardship, leading to stress and so on. This particular picture was taken on a very special day when the first patient given cimetidine in the UK clinical trials was treated right here in Rotherham. All this took place only a relatively short period after forward viewing gastroscopes became available. It was an exciting time with a lot happening, uh, with a lot happening rapidly. Next slide. And here we have photographs from the same patient just four weeks later. An absolute miracle for such rapid healing was unknown. Next slide. The slide summarizes our results. Rapid healing was achieved in around two-thirds of patients on cimetidine. More important for the individual patient was the rapid relief from pain which cimetidine gave. This had widespread benefit, which in my earlier days I could never have imagined. Next slide. I had the honor to present the results of the first cimetidine study in the international conference held at the Royal College of Physicians in 1976. Hidden amongst the many distinguished investigators present is an imposter, me. Next slide. Here is Professor Sir James Black. It was he and his team who over a 10-year period developed cimetidine. He was later awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine. Next slide. You can see not only was Rotherham pioneering in the use of cimetidine, 
it was also where photobombing began. Here is Sir James Black with his fellow Nobel laureates and me. Next slide. Growth in endoscopy at Rotherham presented the opportunity for our first PhD. A small research grant from Smithline and French gave us the means for our first exploration in fundamental science. Bob Kapoor developed a system of ambulatory pH metry. This was the state of the art at the time. Next slide. Bob showed there is little acid in the stomach at night, which intuitively makes sense. After all, one does not eat during sleep. We then investigated the pattern of acid production in our duodenal ulcer patients. The key observation was that when the ulcer is active, acid fails to be switched off at night. In effect, the stomach seems unaware of the time. Of course, we now know much more about circadian rhythm and the marvel of the clock genes which regulate daytime and nighttime acidity. Next slide. But what happened in the longer term having healed the ulcer? On switching to placebo, most relapsed within two years, whereas just a single bedtime dose of 400 mg of cimetidine sustained prolonged remission in most. Next slide. So where do our longer term results come from? From the very outset, we kept a register of endoscopy results. Later, a card index system was formed. By 1987, computers were more readily available and we acquired a BBC computer which enabled us to expand the amount of information we could collect. By now, we had almost 4,000 patients in the database. We reviewed all their hospital case notes to extract additional data and to ensure accuracy before entering them on the computer. We also kept a handwritten card in the case notes so that at each visit a summary could be quickly seen. There was no such thing as sharing of computerized information in those days. For the first time we were able to retrieve information quickly. The very first query took just under two hours to find the answer. It seemed a miracle to us how very different it is today when we expect results in just two seconds. Next slide. So let's return to our patients. What happened to those whose ulcers did not heal quickly despite increasing the dose of cimetidine to two grams or even to three grams in some? On the right, you can see the degree of acid reduction was variable between individuals, but the mean reduction was as great in the resistant ulcer patients as in the responsive. Importantly, it did not appear to be dose related. Next slide. Later, we were able to examine the failure to heal in over 750 patients. With each healing course, about 10% of patients were refractory, two-thirds on their very first or second course of H2RA. However, in some, failure to heal suddenly appeared after several successful healing courses. Next slide. Here you can see some of the reports from the long-term results from the database. Doctors Raju and Nayar were just two of our Brett fellows who came to Rotherham from India. Next slide. Over a 27 year period, we witnessed a decline in the numbers of newly referred patients with peptic ulcer. As you can see from the trend lines, the decline was mainly in duodenal ulcer. There was also a decline in gastric ulcer in the younger people but this was offset by the increasing proportions amongst the elderly. So the question obviously arises, did the overall decline result in less work for the gastroenterologists? Next slide. One might say God was on our side, for as peptic ulcer declined, there was a rapid increase in the number of patients presenting with gastroesophageal reflux disease as shown by the green line on the graph. This opened up new avenues of investigation for us. Next slide. From our large reflux population, 
we investigated several areas, most latterly Barrett's esophagus, to which I will return later. Here I would like to share with you just one interesting element which we termed pseudomembranous esophagitis. A thin yellow or black membrane which can be peeled away with biopsy forceps covers the lower half of the esophagus. This distinctive appearance is very different to the usually erosive changes seen in reflux disease. Related to systemic illness, often in the elderly, it heals rapidly when the patient's general condition improves. You yourself may have seen endoscopy images like this at your center. Next slide. I mentioned funding earlier. Our research income came through collaboration with the pharmaceutical industry in clinical trials, which was a pleasure as we were working with first-class scientists and medical teams. These funds were held at the hospital, but new regulations were introduced, making it necessary for separate arrangements to protect the funds. This became the spur to the creation of our research charity in 1989. Next slide. It was my wife Gauri's vision and belief which shaped the Brett model. Gauri has also been my spiritual guide. She was a few years my junior in medical school in Berlour, but even then held strongly to the view that when fortune favors one, it is the person's moral duty to share the good fortune with others and thereby help everyone to progress. Next slide. Our work was clinically driven through which we made observations leading to exploration through fundamental science studies, that is to say, curiosity driven for its own sake. These were carried out both at Rotherham Hospital and the nearby University of Sheffield, and later in collaboration with other university centers. Several of the results could then be incorporated back into clinical medicine a wonderful example of translational research. So a one-sentence description of the Brett model is from bedside to the bench and then back to the bedside. Next slide. When Brett was formed, the aims of the trust were clearly stated. I would like to take a few moments to clarify the important points. Firstly, the trustees believe that medicine is best served when led by research, supported by science, and sustained always by compassion. The principal, the principal requirement or qualification of the candidate is to have the necessary drive, determination, and ability to develop good ideas. The person's background or educational status is not nearly as important as their character. The aim was for the research to be carried out in Rotherham or Sheffield, but in fact, Brett became a national charity and also helped candidates from overseas. Next slide. A further aim of the trust was to encourage researchers of any age. A wonderful example of age not being a barrier is the work of the remarkable surgeon, Mr. Frank Tubby. Next slide. In 1951, Frank and his late wife Winifred moved to Mysore, where they stayed for 16 years. He had a major interest in the geographical distribution of duodenal ulcer in India and its relationship to staple diets, research into which he continued on his return to the UK in 1968. He has written widely on peptic ulcer disease in India and the role of dietary factors which protect against ulcer. His first paper on peptic ulcer disease was in 1955 and the latest in 2015, a remarkable span of 60 years. Just to show Brett does encourage researchers of any age, the charity was able to support some of Frank's research as shown by his paper in 2011, written at the age of 90. Next slide. First class mentorship is the central feature of Brett-supported research. 
the mentor must devote time to nurture and guide the person. In effect, the project is the means to allow the person to grow. Next slide. And finally, how is success to be measured? I can only quote Booker T. Washington, who was descended from slaves. He writes, Success is to be measured not so much by the position that one has reached in life as by the obstacles which one has overcome while trying to succeed. Next slide. Brett has supported a large number of higher degrees in both medicine and science. It has also supported education, including providing the means for six talented students from India to study the Master's Molecular Science course at University of Sheffield. I am pleased to say all are currently doing PhDs or postdoctoral fellowships at various places in Europe. Crucially, Brett has supported our own hospital team members, specifically Christine Royston who developed our extraordinary database and Beverly Mason who has coordinated all our education and research programs. Next slide. Our work has led us into numerous areas of investigation, but time is too short to present results from all. Some of our Brett Fellows are with you today. I believe Matt Kurian and Nina Kalia have presented some of their work to you already this morning. Later, David Randall will present his work on the detection of adhesions and Shashir Shetty on liver fibrosis. I will concentrate on just a few areas which had a major effect on our thinking and which may be of interest to you. Next slide. So where did the research begin? This is my laboratory at the hospital. It is small and compact but fully functioning and much has emerged from it. Let me share some of our experiences with you. Next slide. At a lecture given by our plastics manufacturer, he commented that unless plastic is kept molten and moving, it congeals, adding this is similar to tomato ketchup. He referred to ketchup as a non-Newtonian fluid which blood is. In health, a wonderful system of fibrinolysis ensures clots do not form in the circulation. Could fibrinolysis be in any way impaired in duodenal ulcer disease? This became our hypothesis for a series of studies. Next slide. By sheer good fortune, Mark Wijinski, a trainee in hematology, spent a couple of years with us. He was able to confirm that fibrinolysis is indeed reduced at the ulcer edges. Two others then joined us. Nina Kalia, who you met earlier, was a physiology student working with my velour classmate, Sam Jacob. Sam was very impressed by Nina and introduced us. Nina, of course, is now a world-class microcirculation expert. Darren Morton, a microbiology scientist, also joined the Brett team to further explore the role of Helicobacter pylori in the formation of peptic ulcer. This was a rare conjunction of talent. So let me tell you something about the early days. Next slide. This is Nina's earlier work. On the left you can see the microcirculation in an anesthetized rat. Importantly, there is no leakage. However, in the second column, you can see the stunning changes which develop when the stomach is soaked in alcohol. Leakage and congestion end with stasis, but crucially, far from the whole mucosa being damaged, there are just a few tiny areas of focal necrosis. Intuitively, an area damaged like this by alcohol could also be damaged by stomach acid. In other words, it is a peptic ulcer, but a very crude one. Nina's genius is shown here in the four figures on the right. Using labeled albumin, she demonstrated its leakage was followed 
by platelet emboli and thrombi. Leukocytes, which should be flowing steadily, now got stuck within the vessels. Next slide. After completing her own PhD, as postdoctoral fellow, she then supervised Hannah Pierce in examining the effect of Helicobacter pylori on new blood vessel formation. Again, some remarkable findings emerged. In the absence of Helicobacter, vessels develop as solid buds which then get hollowed out to form new vessels, as shown on top right. Using Helicobacter extracts, Hannah examined the effect on microcirculation. The striking feature was that it blocked the cell cycle, thereby preventing new buds forming at the G0 stage, the very first step of the cell cycle. We were aware that an extensive network of blood vessels and collaterals are present throughout the stomach and duodenum which protect the mucosa. So if Helicobacter affected angiogenesis, changes would be widespread. So why are most peptic ulcers limited to the lesser curve of the stomach than the first part of the duodenum? The answer came quite by chance. Next slide. I had a call from an anatomist and microcirculation expert who wanted to present some of his work at our regional meeting. He drew attention to his own work, which clearly demonstrated that ulcer-bearing area is the only part of the upper gastrointestinal tract where there are no collaterals, only end vessels. In other words, if end vessels got blocked, that zone of mucosa cannot be rescued by collaterals. This provided a compelling answer to the mystery why helicobacter-related peptic ulcers are restricted to a small area. Next slide. C. urea breath test is the gold standard and uses a stable isotope. This requires complex and expensive machinery which we lacked in Rotherham. So Dr. Raju and our team developed our own system using the radioactive 14C isotope at a very low dose. This proved reliable and less expensive. Several of our patients underwent both types of breath tests and the graph shows the correlation between the two, the key point being it was just as good. This way of making the most of what is available is a characteristic of our unit. Next slide. I would like to bring to your attention our work on bile acid malabsorption, both because it is clinically important, but also as it was an area of particular interest to Dr. Jilan. The standard method of investigating bile acid handling was by measuring the amount passed in feces collected for three to five days. A messy business for both patient and laboratory. The slide shows that bile acids are produced in the liver, concentrated in the gallbladder, and then ejected into the duodenum as food arrives. In health, around 97% of the bile salts are then reabsorbed in the terminal ileum and recycled, and only a small amount, some 3%, passed into the colon. With ileal disease, such as inflammation from Crohn's disease or ileal resection, less is absorbed and more spills into the colon, reducing water reabsorption, causing watery stools. This can also occur after cholecystectomy or vigotomy. So how do we measure the absorption rate? Next slide. CCAT is a synthetic bile acid labeled with radioactive selenium given in a capsule. The isotope is neither metabolized nor broken down by bacteria. Being a bile acid, it tracks the enterohepatic circulation. The equipment required is a standard gamma camera, which is available in many centers in India. Supine and prone baseline readings are taken and the measurements repeated at day 7, from which the percentage of CCAT retained can be calculated. Our cutoff is 10%. Anything less signifies bile acid malabsorption. Next slide. This table summarizes our first 10 years experience. I stress all these patients had chronic diarrhea 
the very reason for doing the CCAT test. Of those with ileal resection, almost all had bile acid malabsorption, 97%, along with more than half the others. Next slide. The surprise was that one third of patients who I labelled as diarrhea predominant irritable bowel syndrome also had bile acid malabsorption. I stress that although the figure is only 33%, the patient group was by far the largest, almost 200 patients. When treated with bile acid sequestrants, those with IBS responded as well as those with structural disease. Dr. Bose has told me that bile acid sequestrants are not available in India. In fact, the two drugs that we used, cholestyramine and cholestipol, are available worldwide and at low cost. Next slide. In 2002, after a cardiac arrest, I stopped acute medicine and spent more time with patients referred with complex problems. Many, particularly women, had proximal constipation. This is a typical example. The plain x-ray shows hard stools with retained radiopaque markers on the left side of the colon, but on the right side, the whole area looks mushy, yet one can actually see markers stuck there too. Next slide. On a walk through the fields near my home, I could not help but notice the difference in appearance of animal droppings. A farming friend kindly brought me cow and horse feces. It was very striking that a pot of cow feces felt much heavier than a similar pot of horse feces. Our obliging radiology department x-rayed these pots and the results were intriguing. You can see that the feces of a cow are much more radiodense than the horses. But when we mix the cow feces with sawdust to form a 50-50 mixture, its radiological appearance now resembled that of a horse. Specifically, there was a lot of air trapped within, which, for lack of a better word, I called mush. This raised the question, what is the nature of such mush? Next slide. By sheer good fortune, I came across a capsule enteroscopy video carried out in a patient who had forgotten to take her bowel preparation. The striking feature is bubbles in the cecum. The colon is full of microbes and it seems intuitive. We are witnessing microbial fermentation. This raised the possibility that if we could analyze the gas, we would gain insight into the nature of microbes. A Brett grant made it possible to work with two superb professors, Dr. Ramesh Arasaradnam, a clinician, and Professor James Covington, the census engineer, at the University of Warwick, which is the home of electronic nose technology. Next slide. Use the original handheld sensor called the Serrano E-Nose, which was pioneered at the University of Warwick in the 1980s. The device has 32 sensors, each responding slightly differently to the vapor, as I hope the slide will show. It is the combined response of the sensors which produces a sort of fingerprint of the odor as a whole. The engineering labs are a bit squeamish dealing with feces, so we now began to study urine instead and later breath samples. Here we see the sensor response to the vapor from a sample of urine from a patient with Crohn's disease. Next slide. We followed up with urine samples from four groups. The e-nose could in fact distinguish between healthy controls, type 2 diabetes, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. These results were then confirmed using mass spectrometry. Next slide. One of our more recent findings is that e-nose technology can also distinguish between colorectal cancer, irritable bowel syndrome and healthy controls. From breath and urine, we can now detect a wide range of conditions, including bile acid diarrhea and celiac disease, and distinguish between different levels of hepatic encephalopathy. Ladies and gentlemen, 
what we are witnessing here is the way gastroenterology may be practiced in the future with invasive procedures giving way to those much less invasive. Next slide. But back to the past. Robert Hall, a retired surgeon from York, asked for our help to examine the near disappearance of pyloric stenosis in York over 70 years. I would like to show just one figure from the paper as it shows the incidence of pyloric stenosis reported from different parts of the world including India. Surgical series are shown in red and non-surgical series in blue. The data from the UK and USA start earlier and show a clear decline in the incidence of pyloric stenosis from the beginning of the 20th century. Data from India from 1932 to 1989 show a high incidence at the start, hence the decline to levels approaching those seen more recently in the West is striking. In sharp contrast, data from Africa start much later and show a high incidence of pyloric stenosis which is rising approaching levels seen once in India in the 1930s and 40s. Next slide. Back to the Rotherham data now. Due to increasing numbers of reflux patients, we had to stop routinely following them up. We therefore concentrated our efforts on Barrett's esophagus, where we have been able to add to the literature in several areas, including mortality and socio-economic deprivation and blood groups. Next slide. Looking at blood groups amongst our Barrett's population, we were surprised to find that patients with blood group O rhesus negative are at greater risk of developing esophageal adenocarcinoma. We were aware that the rhesus D antigen is important in blood grouping but could not understand how it could increase the risk of developing Barrett's cancer. It was actually my son-in-law, Dr. Christopher Horrigan, who made the rhesus link for us. Chris is now the principal investigator at the NIH Leukemia Unit in USA. Just a tip to all of you with daughters, it does help to have a son-in-law who is a scientist. When saliva meets acidic gastric juice, nitric oxide is produced at the cardia, but in reflux and in Barrett's in particular, the reaction moves proximally into the esophagus. It turns out that in nature, the prime role of rhesus D is the rapid delivery of neutral gases which may be reduced in rhesus negative patients, making the person more susceptible to DNA damage from the nitric oxide. What is difficult to explain is why being of blood group O heightens the risk. Just to complete the story, here is Chris with my daughter Suchitra, a pediatric gastroenterologist and our first grandchild da Daniel. I feel compelled to add that it is not because Chris is a first class scientist I said yes when he asked my permission if he could marry my daughter. He just is a lovely person. Next, to round off our database work, I would like to share with you our two latest studies. This recently published paper tells of the long-term outcome of our 1468 Barrett's patients, the largest single center study in the UK. Data was collected prospectively over a 37 year period and updated at each visit, which is the real strength of the report. It shows the outcome in the real world that is not an academic center, but a district general hospital, the setting where most of the Barrett's patients in the UK are seen and treated. Next slide. It is the intense feel for the data in a first class database, which points one in directions to explore, as a final work, which is in the process of publication, shows. We knew more men had reflux but closer examination showed differences across the whole spectrum. We found men are more likely to develop erosive esophagitis, 
Barrett's esophagus and adenocarcinoma, whereas women are more likely to have non-erosive reflux and to develop reflux later than men. The question arises, are men more vulnerable to reflux or are women protected? Early evidence is emerging that female sex hormones may have a protective role in gourd during the reproductive period. We suggest reflux and its consequences may be an example of special protection conferred on Eve. Next slide. So where did all this activity lead to? Brett has given a wide range of academic support from BMED Bachelor of Medical Science to full PhDs, MDs and postdoctoral fellowships leading to national and international collaborations and publications. This was of great benefit to our patients for we started with the highest mortality from peptic ulcer in the region and it fell rapidly to the lowest. This owed to the nature of our practice for our open access system ensured patients could be endoscoped more quickly and given targeted treatment, the right treatment for the right patient at the right time. The end result was maximum benefit for the least cost. Brett has provided research staff to support the expansion of clinical gastroenterology in the hospital. We have had the honor of meeting people from all around the globe who we would not have met in any other circumstances and many have become our lifelong friends. Finally, and I say this with all humility, we have been an outstanding team of doctors, scientists and investigators as well as organizational experts whose skills are rooted in the common sense and judgment I so badly lack. It is our privilege to see our former trainees, both medical and scientists, to develop into first-class investigators who have gone on to great careers in their field. So what has been my individual role in all of this? I have contributed a little but only just a little, but it is we together who have achieved much. Next slide. These are some lessons I have learnt along the way. Opportunity exists everywhere and is not limited to academic centres. Some of the key ingredients for research and development are highly portable, for they involve imagination, inspiration or the ability to be inspired and finally perspiration. Life throws up difficulties in one's path, but it is only those who persevere who go on to develop. It is not the topic, but the people who make the difference. It is here that the role of the mentor is crucial. Finally, and above all else, it has been terrific fun. Next slide. I'd like to show you some of the many who have made all this possible. My wife, Gauri, inspired the creation of Brett. My superb team, Bev, Christine and Liz. I wish to pay a tribute to my wonderful patients who put their trust in me, particularly in my younger days when I was just beginning to learn my field. I grew at a time when my hospital management was very supportive, for they intuitively understood that pursuit of excellence ultimately leads to high standards of clinical practice. Next slide. Here are just a few of the enthusiastic young doctors I was fortunate to have in our team over the years. They have all developed outstanding careers. You may recognize some of them. Next slide. Just in case no one seemed familiar, perhaps I can single one of them out. Here is a very young Kalyan when he was a registrar. When I fell ill much later, he generously returned as a consultant to run the unit in my absence, a great comfort to me, for I knew the team was in good hands. Kalyan has a lovely habit of dropping into our office 
are popping up unexpectedly in various locations. In this instance, it was the Digestive Diseases Week in USA. Finally, on an arranged visit this time, here he is at our home. Ladies and gentlemen, I am now at the end of my presentation and would like to express my gratitude to Dr. Bose for inviting me. Thank you.